Before you hear the next part of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions 35 to 37. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 37. Right, now let's have a detailed look at how the bridge was raised for ships to pass through it. This is a slide showing a diagram of the bridge. And here, you can see at the far end of the south side of it, are the original engine rooms, which you can visit today if you take a tour of the bridge. In here, there was a boiler, which was powered by coal. This boiler produced steam, which powered two big engines. And these engines produced pressurised water, which was stored in six containers called accumulators. This was sent via pipes to some more accumulators in each of the two piers in the central section of the bridge. When it was time to open the bridge, the bridge operator, situated at the bottom of the tower on the south side, pulled a set of levers to set in motion the opening of the bascules. This action started engines in each of the two piers, each of them operating one of the two bascules. Gears attached to these two engines, which were called the driving engines, would then turn, causing the bascules to rise and open. The bascules rose to an angle of 86 degrees, providing enough room for ships to get through the central part of the bridge. Although the process was quite complex, it actually took only about a minute for the bascules to rise to their maximum height. Before you hear the next part of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions 35 to 37. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 37. Right, now let's have a detailed look at how the bridge was raised for ships to pass through it. This is a slide showing a diagram of the bridge. And here, you can see at the far end of the south side of it, are the original engine rooms, which you can visit today if you take a tour of the bridge. In here, there was a boiler, which was powered by coal. This boiler produced steam, which powered two big engines. And these engines produced pressurised water, which was stored in six containers called accumulators. This was sent via pipes to some more accumulators in each of the two piers in the central section of the bridge. When it was time to open the bridge, the bridge operator, situated at the bottom of the tower on the south side, pulled a set of levers to set in motion the opening of the bascules. This action started engines in each of the two piers, each of them operating one of the two bascules. Gears attached to these two engines, which were called the driving engines, would then turn, causing the bascules to rise and open. The bascules rose to an angle of 86 degrees, providing enough room for ships to get through the central part of the bridge. Although the process was quite complex, it actually took only about a minute for the bascules to rise to their maximum height. Section 2. You will hear a man who owns a holiday home talking on the phone to a woman who is staying there. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. Hello? Hi, it's Laura Carlton here. We've just arrived at the holiday flat, but I can't get the hot water and heating to work. 
Oh, right. That's easy. Don't worry. In the upstairs cupboard, you'll find the water heater. You'll see three main controls on the left at the bottom of the heater. The first one, the round one on the far left, is the most important one for the heating and hot water. It's the main control switch. Make sure it's in the on position. The switch itself doesn't light up, but the little square below will be black if the switch is off. <laughs> That's probably what's happened. It's got switched off by mistake. The middle one of these three controls, you'll see it's slightly larger than the first one, controls the radiators. If you feel cold while you're there and need the radiators on, this needs to be turned to maximum. The last of the three controls, the one on the right, is usually on about a number four setting, which for the water in the taps is usually quite hot enough. Below the heating controls in the middle is a small round plastic button. If there isn't enough water in the pipes, sometimes the heater goes out. If this happens, you'll need to press this button to reset the heater. Hold it in for about five seconds and the heater should come on again. Then there's a little square indicator under the third knob that's a kind of alarm light. It'll flash if you need to reset the heater. Mm, it sounds complicated. <laughs> I'm sure you won't have any problems with it. There should be some more instructions on the side of the heater. Call me back if you can't make it work. OK. Section 2. You will hear a man who owns a holiday home talking on the phone to a woman who is staying there. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. Hello? Hi, it's Laura Carlton here. We've just arrived at the holiday flat, but I can't get the hot water and heating to work. Oh, right. That's easy. Don't worry. In the upstairs cupboard, you'll find the water heater. You'll see three main controls on the left at the bottom of the heater. The first one, the round one on the far left, is the most important one for the heating and hot water. It's the main control switch. Make sure it's in the on position. The switch itself doesn't light up, but the little square below will be black if the switch is off. <laughs> That's probably what's happened. It's got switched off by mistake. The middle one of these three controls, you'll see it's slightly larger than the first one, controls the radiators. If you feel cold while you're there and need the radiators on, this needs to be turned to maximum. The last of the three controls, the one on the right, is usually on about a number four setting, which for the water in the taps is usually quite hot enough. Below the heating controls in the middle is a small round plastic button. If there isn't enough water in the pipes, sometimes the heater goes out. If this happens, you'll need to press this button to reset the heater. Hold it in for about five seconds and the heater should come on again. Then there's a little square indicator under the third knob that's a kind of alarm light. It'll flash if you need to reset the heater. Mm, it sounds complicated. <laughs> I'm sure you won't have any problems with it. There should be some more instructions on the side of the heater. Call me back if you can't make it work. OK. And finally, I'd like to tell you about our new wildlife area, Hinchingbrook Park, which will be opened to the public next month. This slide doesn't really indicate how big it is, but anyway, you can see the two gates into the park and the main paths. As you can see, there's a lake in the northwest of the park with a bird hide to the west of it at the end of a path. So it'll be a nice, quiet place for watching the birds on the lake. 
fairly close to where refreshments are available, there's a dog walking area in the southern part of the park, leading off from the path. And if you just want to sit and relax, you can go to the flower garden. That's the circular area on the map, surrounded by paths. And finally, there's a wooded area in the western section of the park, between two paths. OK, that's enough from me, so let's get on. And finally, I'd like to tell you about our new wildlife area, Hinchingbrook Park, which will be opened to the public next month. This slide doesn't really indicate how big it is, but anyway, you can see the two gates into the park and the main paths. As you can see, there's a lake in the northwest of the park with a bird hide to the west of it at the end of a path. So it'll be a nice, quiet place for watching the birds on the lake. Fairly close to where refreshments are available, there's a dog walking area in the southern part of the park, leading off from the path. And if you just want to sit and relax, you can go to the flower garden. That's the circular area on the map, surrounded by paths. And finally, there's a wooded area in the western section of the park, between two paths. OK, that's enough from me, so let's get on. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. Now, if I can just show on this wall map here where they all are, uh, you might like to go and have a look round. If you come into the main university entrance, at the first junction, you'll find that Brown Hall is on the corner opposite the theatre. So you're nice and near the station here, though I think it can get a bit noisy with traffic. The same applies to Blake Residence, which is directly facing the junction to the university entrance. These halls are often used by medical students and such like, as they're out all day, so don't notice the noise. Anyway, if you then walk along Campus Road towards the main circle, you'll see the library on the corner, and Queen's Building is just past that as you head north. You will find that it is quieter here, and you may get fewer visitors. By the way, the circle is quite a feature of the campus, as it's set into the hills and has a brand new sports centre in the middle. It's worth going to look around it. Now, the Parkway Flats are on the opposite corner to the library, facing the circle, as you head towards the main buildings. The main buildings are only about a five-minute walk from here, and places in these halls go quickly, so my advice is to reserve your place as soon as possible. Then, Temple Rise is inside the circle, next to the sports centre, but further from the main university buildings. Now, if you'd like to go off and physically... You now have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. Now, if I can just show on this wall map here where they all are, uh, you might like to go and have a look round. If you come into the main university entrance, at the first junction, you'll find that Brown Hall is on the corner opposite the theatre. So you're nice and near the station here, though I think it can...
can get a bit noisy with traffic. The same applies to Blake residence, which is directly facing the junction to the university entrance. These halls are often used by medical students and such like, as they're out all day, so don't notice the noise. Anyway, if you then walk along Campus Road towards the main circle, you'll see the library on the corner, and Queen's Building is just past that as you head north. You will find that it is quieter here, and you may get fewer visitors. By the way, the circle is quite a feature of the campus, as it's set into the hills and has a brand new sports centre in the middle. It's worth going to look around it. Now, the Parkway Flats are on the opposite corner to the library, facing the circle, as you head towards the main buildings. The main buildings are only about a five-minute walk from here, and places in these halls go quickly, so my advice is to reserve your place as soon as possible. Then, Temple Rise is inside the circle, next to the sports centre, but further from the main university buildings. Now, if you'd like to go off and physically... Test 2, Section 2. You will hear a library assistant talking about the library she works in. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Hi, can I help you? Um, yes. I wanted to join the library. OK. First of all, let me show you around the library and explain a few things for you. OK, now we're here at the main entrance. You can see the reception, which is where you bring back and take out books. And also, we can order books and answer your questions there. Mm -hmm. Next to the reception, where you can see those old desks, is where we keep the magazines, because you can sit down and read there. They're divided into sections for sciences, geography, arts, etc. Uh, then, at the back of the library, you can see the section for old books. And next to that is where the books proper start. That used to be the science section. But now, on those shelves, you'll find the art section. We had a big reorganisation in the summer, which I think has made it clearer. Oh. <laughs> the numbering is standard, so you should be able to find what you want quite easily. However, if you can't find something, it probably means it's been borrowed. OK, then in the corner, next to the reference section, is where we thought it was quietest and away from the phones and printers and things, so we've put the study desks there. They all have computer access if you need it for your laptop. No. We do ask that you don't just read magazines there, though. OK, uh, then there's the reference section, where you can look up the files. Then, as we come back to the main entrance, is the next section, where we used to have the languages. It got very busy and noisy, so when we moved everything round, we decided to put the law books here. Also, because it's a smaller section, it fits quite well here. Ah. OK, then, we're back at the main entrance. Over there, by reception, there's a door that goes to the extension. And we have further sections, such as languages and study desks through there. So you could have a look round when we've finished. Then, just between reception and the door here, is where we decided to put the computers, 
but the computer magazines are in the magazine section. As we found, too many went missing here. <laughs> OK, is that everything? Test 2, Section 2. You will hear a library assistant talking about the library she works in. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Hi, can I help you? Um, yes. I wanted to join the library. OK. First of all, let me show you around the library and explain a few things for you. OK, now we're here at the main entrance. You can see the reception, which is where you bring back and take out books. And also, we can order books and answer your questions there. Mm -hmm. Next to the reception, where you can see those old desks, is where we keep the magazines, because you can sit down and read there. They're divided into sections for sciences, geography, arts, etc. Uh, then, at the back of the library, you can see the section for old books. And next to that is where the books proper start. That used to be the science section. But now, on those shelves, you'll find the art section. We had a big reorganisation in the summer, which I think has made it clearer. Oh. <laughs> the numbering is standard, so you should be able to find what you want quite easily. However, if you can't find something, it probably means it's been borrowed. OK, then in the corner, next to the reference section, is where we thought it was quietest and away from the phones and printers and things. So we've put the study desks there. They all have computer access if you need it for your laptop. No. We do ask that you don't just read magazines there, though. OK, uh, then there's the reference section where you can look up the files. Then, as we come back to the main entrance, is the next section, where we used to have the languages. It got very busy and noisy, so when we moved everything round, we decided to put the law books here. Also, because it's a smaller section, it fits quite well here. Ah. OK, then, we're back at the main entrance. Over there, by reception, there's a door that goes to the extension. And we have further sections, such as languages and study desks through there. So you could have a look round when we've finished. Then, just between reception and the door here, is where we decided to put the computers. But the computer magazines are in the magazine section. As we found, too many went missing here. <laughs> OK, is that everything? You now have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. OK, thanks. How can I get from here to Hackney, then? Right, well, you can choose. Uh, we're here at the information office, OK? Uh, now, next to us, on the corner of the High Street and Sweet Street, is the bus stop, opposite the bank. Uh -huh. The bus goes all the way to Hackney, but it is a very indirect route, so it could take ages. Uh. If you want to take the train, walk down the High Street towards the city. 
go past the bank, and on your left is the station,、mm -hmm. just before you get to the post office.、Mm. There's a mainline service to Hackney Wick, so if you need to get into the centre of Hackney, you may need to pick up a bus when you get there.、Mm. Opposite the post office, on the corner of Hart Lane, is the tube entrance. You'll see the big signs. That's probably the best way to get there, though you may have to change. It's probably best if you go and get a travel card first.、Oh. To get to the ticket office, you go out of here onto the high street, then turn into South Street, and the ticket office is on your right, opposite the cinema.、Mm. Of course, you may decide it's quicker to take a taxi, <laughs> but it's a long way, so I think it'll be very expensive. If you do want to get a cab, then the rank is outside here, just opposite the office. You now have thirty seconds to read questions sixteen to twenty. Okay, thanks. How can I get from here to Hackney then? Right. Well, you can choose.、Uh, we're here at the information office. Okay.、Uh, now, next to us, on the corner of the High Street and Sweet Street, is the bus stop opposite the bank. Uh huh. The bus goes all the way to Hackney, but it is a very indirect route, so it could take ages.、Oh. If you want to take the train, walk down the High Street towards the city. Go past the bank, and on your left is the station,、mm -hmm. just before you get to the post office.、Mm. There's a mainline service to Hackney Wick, so if you need to get into the centre of Hackney, you may need to pick up a bus when you get there.、Mm. Opposite the post office, on the corner of Hart Lane, is the tube entrance. You'll see the big signs. That's probably the best way to get there, though you may have to change. It's probably best if you go and get a travel card first.、Oh. To get to the ticket office, you go out of here onto the high street, then turn into South Street, and the ticket office is on your right, opposite the cinema.、Mm. Of course, you may decide it's quicker to take a taxi, <laughs> but it's a long way, so I think it'll be very expensive. If you do want to get a cab, then the rank is outside here, just opposite the office. Section two. You will hear a university administrator telling a group of new students about the central campus buildings and the facilities they provide. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Welcome everyone to the Brandon Complex, the geographical and we could say spiritual heart of this university. This is basically where everyone eats too, as you can see by looking around. There are many different cuisines here: Chinese, Indian, and Middle Eastern, plus the usual fare of a local type, all in that corner over there. We have many shops here too, but the biggest is Wilson's, right there, providing clothing and hardware. That's next to all the restaurants. Now, on the opposite side of Wilson's, we have three shops. The one in the corner there, closest to the restaurants, is for DVDs. Yes, the DVDs are cheap and affordable, and you can also rent DVD players as well. Moving on. In the corner directly opposite Wilson's is the student union office.
Incidentally, you are all encouraged to join the student union, as a student union card gives you many benefits, including discounts on basically everything you can buy here at the Brandon complex. Outside this complex, on the other side of the road, you can just see it from here in fact, is a building that we call by the rather unusual name, the H building. Next to this, on the other side of some trees along the main road, is the Engineering Institute, but that doesn't have anything to do with the Brandon complex. One last thing is that just outside this door, near us here, you can see a grassy oval patch. Well, that's the playing field for what we simply call the fitness room, which is alongside. So you can put on some calories here at the restaurants and then burn them off at the fitness room afterwards. Oh, I forgot to mention this shop right here, in the middle, beside the student union. It's the bookshop. And, as you can see, it's always busy, always popular. You can buy newspapers, magazines and stationery there, plus a few clothing items as well, just as you can at Wilson's. Why don't you go and take a look right now? Section 2 You will hear a university administrator telling a group of new students about the central campus buildings and the facilities they provide. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome everyone to the Brandon Complex, the geographical and, we could say, spiritual heart of this university. This is basically where everyone eats too, as you can see by looking around. There are many different cuisines here, Chinese, Indian and Middle Eastern, plus the usual fare of a local type, all in that corner over there. We have many shops here too, but the biggest is Wilson's, right there, providing clothing and hardware. That's next to all the restaurants. Now, on the opposite side of Wilson's we have three shops. The one in the corner there, closest to the restaurants, is for DVDs. Yes, the DVDs are cheap and affordable, and you can also rent DVD players as well. Moving on. In the corner directly opposite Wilson's is the Student Union office. Incidentally, you are all encouraged to join the Student Union, as a Student Union card gives you many benefits, including discounts on basically everything you can buy here at the Brandon Complex. Outside this complex, on the other side of the road, you can just see it from here in fact, is a building that we call by the rather unusual name, the H building. Next to this, on the other side of some trees along the main road, is the Engineering Institute, but that doesn't have anything to do with the Brandon complex. One last thing is that just outside this door, near us here, you can see a grassy oval patch. Well, that's the playing field for what we simply call the fitness room, which is alongside. So you can put on some calories here at the restaurants and then burn them off at the fitness room afterwards. Oh, I forgot to mention this shop right here, in the middle, beside the student union. It's the bookshop. And, as you can see, it's always busy, always popular. You can buy newspapers, magazines and stationery there, plus a few clothing items as well, just as you can at Wilson's. Why don't you go and take a look right now? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 
to 20. Right, let me orient you to our main easy travel office here. On this table right beside us are travel magazines for you to browse through and on the wall next to that are many more for all parts of the world. Our four travel consultants sit over there on the other side of that long counter. That's right, four of them, side by side, all serving various regions. Now, let me tell you their specific functions. Firstly, the consultant on the left next to the plant is the local tours consultant serving tours in the immediate vicinity of this city. Next to her is what we call regional tours targeting the statewide options. Next to her is the interstate tours and that can involve either buses or planes. In the former case utilising the sleek line bus service as you know. And finally, next to her in the corner is General Inquiries, which is self-explanatory. If you have questions of a general nature, rather than one relating to specific destinations, you can go there. Now, as I said, we can do international tours, and for that you need our big office, just through that door, the one between those two plants. However, if your international tour is in the Asian region, which is generally our most popular option, then we deal with that in a separate room, the one opposite international tours, but not the corner one. Just go through that door on the left, the one next to that cupboard. The door next to that is, in fact, our general office, so please don't go through there. That's reserved for staff members only. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Right, let me orient you to our main easy travel office here. On this table right beside us are travel magazines for you to browse through and on the wall next to that are many more for all parts of the world. Our four travel consultants sit over there on the other side of that long counter. That's right, four of them side by side, all serving various regions. Now, let me tell you their specific functions. Firstly, the consultant on the left, next to the plant, is the local tours consultant, serving tours in the immediate vicinity of this city. Next to her is what we call regional tours, targeting the statewide options. Next to her is the interstate tours, and that can involve either buses or planes. In the former case, utilising the sleek line bus service, as you know. And finally, next to her in the corner is General Inquiries, which is self-explanatory. If you have questions of a general nature, rather than one relating to specific destinations, you can go there. Now, as I said, we can do international tours, and for that you need our big office, just through that door, the one between those two plants. However, if your international tour is in the Asian region, which is generally our most popular option, then we deal with that in a separate room, the one opposite international tours, but not the corner one. Just go through that door on the left, the one next to that cupboard. The door next to that is, in fact, our general office, so please don't go through there. That's reserved for staff members only. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Guess what, Liz? There's another interesting thing in this orientation booklet, and it looks important, about a style guide. What's that? Take a look yourself. It seems to be a set of rules regarding how to present written work, essays and that sort of thing, to the lecturers. They want a uniform style of presentation. I can see, so everything we hand in must have a header and a footer. A what? A header and a footer. The footer is at the bottom of the page and the header is at the very top. That's why they call it a header, you know. That little bit of writing giving details about the work. And they also want the word count. Why do they need that? I guess because the lecturers will specify the number of words they want for their assignment. And they want to be sure students follow this. And even the heading on the page has to be a specific dimension. 16 points and bold print and underlined. And subheadings are 14 points and the font has to be Arial for everything. Yes, the main text is Arial too, as you said, and the size is 12 points, with the header and footer being slightly smaller at 10 points each. Well, it seems logical. The size of everything is in proportion to its importance. But why do they need the spacing of the main text to be one and a half? The header and footer are different. They're only single-spaced. Probably to allow the teacher to insert comments or corrections, or just to make it all more readable, I suppose. And we need wide margins on the left, right, top and bottom. Probably for the same reason. Lots of space to allow the addition of comments. That's a bit scary, actually. It seems to assume we will be making mistakes. And look what they want in the header and footer. The header has the name of the work. Not the name of the teacher? No, the work. But surely the teacher's name must go somewhere. Ah, here it is. It goes in the footer. OK. I'd say this is all logical. If a page is lost, say, falls to the floor, then with all this information it can always be traced back to the teacher involved. Right. As you say. All very logical. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Guess what, Liz? There's another interesting thing in this orientation booklet. And it looks important about a style guide. What's that? Take a look yourself. It seems to be a set of rules regarding how to present written work, essays and that sort of thing to the lecturers. They want a uniform style of presentation. I can see, so everything we hand in must have a header and a footer. A what? A header and a footer. The footer is at the bottom of the page and the header is at the very top. That's why they call it a header, you know. That little bit of writing giving details about the work. And they also want the word count. Why do they need that? I guess because the lecturers will specify the number of words they want for their assignment. And they want to be sure students follow this. And even the heading on the page has to be a specific dimension. 16 points and bold print and underlined. And subheadings are 14 points and the font has to be Arial for everything. Yes, the main text is Arial too, as you said, and the size is 12 points, with the header and footer being slightly smaller at 10 points each. Well, it seems logical. The size of everything is in proportion to its importance, but why do they need the spacing of the main text to be one and a half? The header and footer are different. They're only single-spaced. Probably to allow the teacher to insert comments or corrections, or just to make it all more readable, I suppose. And we need wide margins on the left, right, top and bottom, probably for the same reason. Lots of space to allow the addition of comments.
That's a bit scary, actually. It seems to assume we will be making mistakes. And look what they want in the header and footer. The header has the name of the work. Not the name of the teacher. No, the work. But surely the teacher's name must go somewhere. Ah, here it is. It goes in the footer. Okay, I'd say this is all logical. If a page is lost, say falls to the floor, then with all this information, it can always be traced back to the teacher involved. Right, as you say, all very logical. You will hear two students discussing an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Hi, Melanie. What did you think of the assignment that we got today? It looks interesting, doesn't it? Yes, Ellen. I've always been interested in recycling, but there's a lot of research to do. Yes, there are a lot of things I'm unsure of, so it's going to be good working with you. Okay. Well, why don't we start by making a flowchart from the notes our tutor gave us? Yes. Um. So, on one side we could have the paper production cycle here on the left, and on the other side the recycling. Good idea. Let's start at the top with the production. The first step in the process is to get the raw materials. Yes, and they tend to come from pine forests. Okay. And then the bark is removed from the outside of the tree, and after that, the wood is chopped up. That's the first three stages. It sounds a bit complicated. After that,、um, it says water is added, and then the mixture is heated and made into pulp.、Uh, this will be the thick paste that is used to make paper. Yes. You're right because after that they use a machine to make the paper, and we can put that right in the centre of the flowchart, because it's also where the recycled paper joins the process. Yes. So once the paper has been produced in the machine, what happens then? Well, I think we should write print as the next step. Because this is when newspapers, magazines, etc., are produced, and we could also add that they have to be distributed to stores and people's homes. Right. Then the recycling bit starts. The old paper's collected, and then it says it's taken somewhere so that someone or something can sort it. I imagine there are different kinds of paper, or things like paper clips that need to be removed. Yes, let's have a step after that. Now, how did our tutor say they do this? Oh yes, it involves chemicals. So, how is your chemistry? <laughs> well, not very good, I'm afraid. But this is how they remove ink. So、um, this is definitely going to need a bit of research. Right.、Uh, the last step in the recycling section is similar to the last step in the production process, with heating and pulping, before the cycle begins again. You will hear two students discussing an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five.
Hi, Melanie. What did you think of the assignment that we got today? It looks interesting, doesn't it? Yes, Ellen. I've always been interested in recycling, but there's a lot of research to do. Yes, there are a lot of things I'm unsure of, so it's going to be good working with you. Okay. Well, why don't we start by making a flowchart from the notes our tutor gave us? Yes.、Um, So on one side we could have the paper production cycle here on the left, and on the other side the recycling. Good idea. Let's start at the top with the production. The first step in the process is to get the raw materials. Yes, and they tend to come from pine forests. Okay. And then the bark is removed from the outside of the tree, and after that, the wood is chopped up. That's the first three stages. It sounds a bit complicated. After that,、um, it says water is added, and then the mixture is heated and made into pulp.、Uh, this will be the thick paste that is used to make paper. Yes. You're right because after that they use a machine to make the paper, and we can put that right in the centre of the flowchart, because it's also where the recycled paper joins the process. Yes. So once the paper has been produced in the machine, what happens then? Well, I think we should write print as the next step. Because this is when newspapers, magazines, etc., are produced, and we could also add that they have to be distributed to stores and people's homes. Right. Then the recycling bit starts. The old paper's collected, and then it says it's taken somewhere so that someone or something can sort it. I imagine there are different kinds of paper, or things like paper clips that need to be removed. Yes, let's have a step after that. Now, how did our tutor say they do this? Oh yes, it involves chemicals. So, how is your chemistry? <laughs> well, not very good, I'm afraid. But this is how they remove ink. So、mm, this is definitely going to need a bit of research. Right.、Uh, the last step in the recycling section is similar to the last step in the production process, with heating and pulping, before the cycle begins again. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at the questions fifteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions fifteen to twenty. Okay, Group B, your turn. Does everyone have a copy of the plan? Oh, great. Okay, we'll all be meeting in the car park. That's on the bottom of the plan. See? Now, if you've been assigned to the vegetable beds, to get there you go out of the car park. And go up the footpath until you reach the circle of trees. There they are in the middle of the plan, and you see that the footpath goes all the way around them. Well, on the left-hand side of that circular footpath, there's a short track which takes you directly to the vegetable beds. You can see a bamboo fence marked just above them. All right. Okay. If you're helping out with the beehives, pay attention. 
Look again at the circle of trees in the middle of the plan and the footpath that goes around them. On the right side of that circle, you can see that the footpath goes off in an easterly direction, heading towards the right hand side of the plan. And then the path splits into two, and you can either go up or down. You want the path that heads down. And at the end of this, you see two areas divided by a bamboo fence. And as we're looking at the plan, the beehives are on the right of the fence, the smaller section, I mean. Now, don't worry, all the bees have been removed. You just need to transport the hives back to the car park. OK. For the seating, look at the circular footpath. At the top of it, there's a path that goes from there and takes you up to the seating area, alongside the bicycle track and with a good view of the island, I suppose. OK, if you're volunteering for the adventure playground area, let's start from the car park again and go up the footpath, but then you want the first left turn. Go up there and then you see there's a short path that goes off to the right. Go down there and that's the adventure playground area, above the bamboo fence. That fence does need repairing, I'm afraid. Right, what else? Oh yes, the sand area. We've got that circular footpath in the middle. Find the track that goes east towards the right-hand side of the plan. And where that track divides, you need the little path that goes up towards the bicycle track. The sand area is just above the bamboo fence there. And finally, the pond area. So. It's on the left-hand side of your plan, towards the top, just above the fruit bushes and to the left of the little path. OK, as I said already, hopefully we'll be... Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at the questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. OK. Group B, your turn. Does everyone have a copy of the plan? Oh, great. OK. We'll all be meeting in the car park. That's on the bottom of the plan. See? Now, if you've been assigned to the vegetable beds, to get there, you go out of the car park and go up the footpath until you reach the circle of trees. There they are, in the middle of the plan. And you see that the footpath goes all the way around them. Well, on the left-hand side of that circular footpath, there's a short track which takes you directly to the vegetable beds. You can see a bamboo fence marked just above them. All right. OK. If you're helping out with the beehives, pay attention. Look again at the circle of trees in the middle of the plan and the footpath that goes around them. On the right side of that circle, you can see that the footpath goes off in an easterly direction, heading towards the right-hand side of the plan. And then... The path splits into two and you can either go up or down. You want the path that heads down. 
and at the end of this, you see two areas divided by a bamboo fence. And as we're looking at the plan, the beehives are on the right of the fence, the smaller section, I mean. Now, don't worry, all the bees have been removed. You just need to transport the hives back to the car park. OK, for the seating, look at the circular footpath. At the top of it, there's a path that goes from there and takes you up to the seating area, alongside the bicycle track and with a good view of the island, I suppose. OK, if you're volunteering for the adventure playground area, let's start from the car park again and go up the footpath, but then you want the first left turn. Go up there and then you see there's a short path that goes off to the right. Go down there and that's the adventure playground area, above the bamboo fence. That fence does need repairing, I'm afraid. Right, what else? Oh yes, the sand area. We've got that circular footpath in the middle. Find the track that goes east towards the right-hand side of the plan and where that track divides, you need the little path that goes up towards the bicycle track. The sand area is just above the bamboo fence there. And finally, the pond area. So, it's on the left-hand side of your plan, towards the top, just above the fruit bushes and to the left of the little path. OK, as I said already, hopefully we'll be... Recording 56 You will hear a tourist information officer explaining local walks to visitors. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Welcome to everyone here. I hope you enjoy your stay in our village and enjoy the local scenery. I'll tell you a bit about the forest and mountain tracks in a minute. But first, I'll just give you an idea of where everything is in the village. So, we're here in the Tourist Information Center, and when you come out of the center, you're on Willow Lane, just opposite the pond. If you want to get to the supermarket for your supplies of food and water, go right. That's the quickest way, and then turn right at the top of Willow Lane, and it's the second building you come to, opposite the old railway station. If you're planning on doing some serious climbing and you need some equipment, we do have an excellent climbing supply store just five minutes walk away. Turn left once you're outside the Tourist Information Center. Take Willow Lane all the way up to Pine Street. You want to go left along here. Then keep walking and go up Mountain Road on your right until you come to the next turning on the left. Head down there and you'll come to the Climbing Supply Store. If you get to the small building that sells ski passes, you'll know you've gone too far. You also need to head to Pine Street for the museum. It's small, but well worth a visit if you're interested in the history of the village and the old gold mining industry. So, when you reach Pine Street from here, you'll see the old railway line on the other side of the road. Turn left into Pine Street and keep going until you come to Mountain Road. And just past here, the museum will be on your left 
just behind the railway line. Don't worry about crossing over the tracks. The train stopped running through here in 1985. If you're planning on following one of the easier forest walks, you might like to hire a bicycle. To get to the hire shop, again, you need to head to Pine Street. On the left-hand side of Pine Street, you'll see the town hall. Go down the little road that you come to just before it, and you'll find the bike hire shop just behind the hall. They have a good range of bikes, so I'm sure you'll find something that suits your needs. Last but not least, if you're hungry after a long day's trek, I can recommend our local cafe. Again, when you leave the Tourist Information Center, turn right and follow Willow Lane until it joins Pine Street. And right opposite, on the far side of the railway tracks, is the cafe. Recording 56. You will hear a tourist information officer explaining local walks to visitors. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Welcome to everyone here. I hope you enjoy your stay in our village and enjoy the local scenery. I'll tell you a bit about the forest and mountain tracks in a minute. But first, I'll just give you an idea of where everything is in the village. So, we're here in the Tourist Information Center, and when you come out of the center, you're on Willow Lane, just opposite the pond. If you want to get to the supermarket for your supplies of food and water, go right. That's the quickest way, and then turn right at the top of Willow Lane, and it's the second building you come to, opposite the old railway station. If you're planning on doing some serious climbing and you need some equipment, we do have an excellent climbing supply store just five minutes walk away. Turn left once you're outside the Tourist Information Center. Take Willow Lane all the way up to Pine Street. You want to go left along here. Then keep walking and go up Mountain Road on your right until you come to the next turning on the left. Head down there and you'll come to the Climbing Supply Store. If you get to the small building that sells ski passes, you'll know you've gone too far. You also need to head to Pine Street for the museum. It's small, but well worth a visit if you're interested in the history of the village and the old gold mining industry. So, when you reach Pine Street from here, you'll see the old railway line on the other side of the road. Turn left into Pine Street and keep going until you come to Mountain Road. And just past here, the museum will be on your left just behind the railway line. Don't worry about crossing over the tracks. The train stopped running through here in 1985. If you're planning on following one of the easier forest walks, you might like to hire a bicycle. To get to the hire shop, again, you need to head to Pine Street. On the left-hand side of Pine Street, you'll see the town hall. Go down the little road that you come to just before it, and you'll find the bike hire shop just behind the hall. They have a good range of bikes, so I'm sure you'll find something that suits your needs. Last but not least, if you're hungry after a long day's trek, I can recommend our local cafe. Again, when you leave the Tourist Information Center, turn right and follow Willow Lane until it joins Pine Street. And right opposite, on the far side of the railway tracks, is the cafe.
before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at the questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, let me just tell you a bit about what you can see in the sculpture park. If you look at your map, you'll see the visitor centre, where we are now, at the bottom, just by the entrance. Since we only have an hour, you might not be able to get right around the park, but you can choose to visit some of the highlights. You might like to take a look at the Joe Tremaine sculptures, which are displayed on this side of the upper lake, just behind the education centre and near the bridge. They're really impressive, but please remember not to let your children climb on them. One of our most popular exhibitions is the Giorgio Catalucci bird sculptures. They're just across the bridge on the north side of the lower lake. I love the way they're scattered around in the long grass beside the lake, looking as if they're just about to take to their wings. You could also go to the garden gallery. It's on this side of the upper lake. From the visitor centre, you go to the education centre, then keep on along the path and you'll see it on your right. There's an exhibition of animal carvings there which is well worth a look. We also have the Longhouse. That's quite a walk. From here, you go to the bridge and then turn left on the other side. Soon you'll see a winding pathway going up towards the northern boundary of the park. Go up there and you'll find it at the top. They have some abstract metal sculptures that are well worth seeing if you have time. OK, well, now... if you're before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at the questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, let me just tell you a bit about what you can see in the sculpture park. If you look at your map, you'll see the visitor centre, where we are now, at the bottom, just by the entrance. Since we only have an hour, you might not be able to get right around the park, but you can choose to visit some of the highlights. You might like to take a look at the Joe Tremaine sculptures, which are displayed on this side of the upper lake, just behind the education centre and near the bridge. They're really impressive, but please remember not to let your children climb on them. One of our most popular exhibitions is the Giorgio Catalucci bird sculptures. They're just across the bridge on the north side of the lower lake. I love the way they're scattered around in the long grass beside the lake, looking as if they're just about to take to their wings. You could also go to the garden gallery. It's on this side of the upper lake. From the visitor centre, you go to the education centre, then keep on along the path and you'll see it on your right. There's an exhibition of animal carvings there which is well worth a look. We also have the Longhouse. That's quite a walk. From here, you go to the bridge and then turn left on the other side. Soon you'll see a winding pathway going up towards the northern boundary of the park. Go up there and you'll find it at the top. They have some abstract metal sculptures that are well worth seeing if you have time. OK, well, now... if you're Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. OK, so this slide shows a map of the central area of Granford with the high street in the middle and school road on the right. Now, we already have a set of traffic lights in the high street at the junction with Station Road, but we're planning to have another set at the other end at the school road junction to regulate the flow of traffic along the high street. We've decided we definitely need a pedestrian crossing. We considered putting this on school road just outside the school, but in the end we decided that could lead to a lot of traffic congestion. So we decided to locate it on the high street, crossing the road in front of the supermarket. That's a very busy area, so it should help things there. We are proposing some changes to parking. At present, parking isn't allowed on the high street outside the library, but we are going to change that and allow parking there, but not at the other end of the high street near School Road. There'll be a new no parking sign on School Road, just by the entrance to the school, forbidding parking for 25 metres. This should improve visibility for drivers and pedestrians, especially on the bend just to the north of the school. As far as disabled drivers are concerned, at present they have parking outside the supermarket, but lorries also use those spaces, so we've got two new disabled parking spaces on the side road up towards the bank. It's not ideal, but probably better than the present arrangement. We also plan to widen the pavement on School Road. We think we can manage to get an extra half metre on the bend just before you get to the school, on the same side of the road. Finally, we've introduced new restrictions on loading and unloading for the supermarket, so lorries will only be allowed to stop there before 8am. That's the supermarket on School Road. We kept to the existing arrangements with the High Street supermarket. OK, so that's about it. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. OK, so this slide shows a map of the central area of Granford with the high street in the middle and school road on the right. Now, we already have a set of traffic lights in the high street at the junction with Station Road, but we're planning to have another set at the other end at the school road junction to regulate the flow of traffic along the high street. We've decided we definitely need a pedestrian crossing. We considered putting this on School Road just outside the school, but in the end we decided that could lead to a lot of traffic congestion. So we decided to locate it on the high street, crossing the road in front of the supermarket. That's a very busy area, so it should help things there. We are proposing some changes to parking. At present, parking isn't allowed on the high street outside the library, but we are going to change that and allow parking there, but not at the other end of the high street near School Road. There'll be a new no parking sign on School Road, just by the entrance to the school, forbidding parking for 25 metres. This should improve visibility for drivers and pedestrians, especially on the bend just to the north of the school. As far as disabled drivers are concerned, at present they have parking outside the supermarket, but lorries also use those spaces, so we've got two new disabled parking spaces on the side road up towards the bank. It's not ideal, 
but probably better than the present arrangement. We also plan to widen the pavement on School Road. We think we can manage to get an extra half metre on the bend just before you get to the school, on the same side of the road. Finally, we've introduced new restrictions on loading and unloading for the supermarket, so lorries will only be allowed to stop there before 8am. That's the supermarket on School Road. We kept to the existing arrangements with the High Street supermarket. OK, so that's about it. Section 2. You will hear a tour guide giving information about a shopping district. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15 on page 6. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. This afternoon we'll visit the city's shopping district. Several blocks in the area are closed to car traffic, and I know you'll enjoy walking around there. I'd like to give you an overview of the district now, since you'll be on your own once we get there. You'll see on this map here that the shopping district consists of two streets, Pear Street, which runs north and south, and Cherry Street, which crosses Pear Street right here. Let's start our tour here on Pear Street, where the star is. This star marks the Harbor View Bookstore. It's very popular among locals as well as tourists. You can buy a range of books of local interest, as well as a variety of magazines and newspapers. It's directly across the street from the city library, which is also worth a visit. It's in one of the oldest buildings in the city, and contains, among other things, an interesting collection of rare books. Now, moving up Pear from the bookstore toward Cherry, the next building on the left is the Pear Cafe. You'll notice it's right on the corner of Pear and Cherry Streets. It's a great place to relax while enjoying a delicious cup of coffee or tea. You can talk with friends or read quietly. They have a variety of books and magazines available. From the windows of the cafe, you can look right across Cherry Street for a lovely view of city gardens. It's a rather small garden, but it contains a variety of exotic plants and flowers. Let's leave the cafe and cross Pear Street. On the opposite corner, we're at Caldwell's Clothing Store, which you might also want to visit. They sell both men's and women's fashions from countries around the world. Continuing down Cherry Street, the next building on the right, after Caldwell's, is the Souvenir Shop. Stop in here to get maps and books about the local area, as well as t-shirts and postcards with pictures of the city. Now, we cross Cherry Street and we're at the Art Gallery, one building down from the corner. Here you can see, and of course, purchase, many fine paintings and sculptures by local artists. Let's keep going down Cherry Street toward the harbor. On the left, right after the gallery, is Harbor Park. It's a lovely place, and it's certainly worth spending some time there. Section 2. You will hear a tour guide giving information about a shopping district. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15 on page 6.
As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. This afternoon, we'll visit the city's shopping district. Several blocks in the area are closed to car traffic, and I know you'll enjoy walking around there. I'd like to give you an overview of the district now, since you'll be on your own once we get there. You'll see on this map here that the shopping district consists of two streets, Pear Street, which runs north and south, and Cherry Street, which crosses Pear Street right here. Let's start our tour here on Pear Street, where the star is. This star marks the Harbor View Bookstore. It's very popular among locals as well as tourists. You can buy a range of books of local interest, as well as a variety of magazines and newspapers. It's directly across the street from the city library, which is also worth a visit. It's in one of the oldest buildings in the city, and contains, among other things, an interesting collection of rare books. Now, moving up Pear from the bookstore toward Cherry, the next building on the left is the Pear Cafe. You'll notice it's right on the corner of Pear and Cherry Streets. It's a great place to relax while enjoying a delicious cup of coffee or tea. You can talk with friends or read quietly. They have a variety of books and magazines available. From the windows of the cafe, you can look right across Cherry Street for a lovely view of city gardens. It's a rather small garden, but it contains a variety of exotic plants and flowers. Let's leave the cafe and cross Pear Street. On the opposite corner, we're at Caldwell's Clothing Store, which you might also want to visit. They sell both men's and women's fashions from countries around the world. Continuing down Cherry Street, the next building on the right, after Caldwell's, is the Souvenir Shop. Stop in here to get maps and books about the local area, as well as t-shirts and postcards with pictures of the city. Now, we cross Cherry Street and we're at the Art Gallery, one building down from the corner. Here you can see, and of course, purchase, many fine paintings and sculptures by local artists. Let's keep going down Cherry Street toward the harbor. On the left, right after the gallery, is Harbor Park. It's a lovely place, and it's certainly worth spending some time there. tour is the Centre City Tour, which goes to all the major attractions in the centre of the city. From the starting point here at the tour bus office, the bus goes to the first stop, Hill Park. As you may guess, this park is located at the top of a small hill. The next stop is the fishing docks. Following that, the bus goes on to the third stop, Bay Bridge, located at the foot of the bridge which crosses the bay. The fourth stop is in the shopping district, then the fifth and last stop is at Green Street. Tour is the Centre City Tour, which goes to all the major attractions in the centre of the city. From the starting point here at the tour bus office, the bus goes to the first stop, Hill Park. As you may guess, this park is located at the top of a small hill. The next stop is the fishing docks. Following that, the bus goes on to the third stop, Bay Bridge, located at the foot of the bridge which crosses the bay. The fourth stop is in the shopping district, then the fifth and last stop is at Green Street. Section 2 You will hear an introductory talk about a new agricultural park. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14.
Welcome to Greenvale Agricultural Park. As you know, we've only been open a week, so you're amongst our first visitors. We have lots of fascinating indoor and outdoor exhibits on our huge complex, spreading hundreds of hectares. Our remit is to give educational opportunities to the wider public, as well as to offer research sites for a wide variety of agriculturists and other scientists. Let's start by seeing what there is to do. As you can see uh, here on our giant wall plan, we are now situated in the reception block here. As you walk out of the main door into the park, there's a path you can follow. If you follow this route, you'll immediately come into the rare breed section, where we keep a wide variety of animals, which I shall be telling you a little more about later. Next to this, uh, moving east, is the large grazing area for the rare breeds. Uh, then further east, in the largest section of our park, is the forest area. Um, south of the grazing area, and in fact just next to the reception block, is our experimental crop area. In the middle of the park, uh, this circular area, is our lake. Uh, these two small rectangular shapes here are the fish farms where we rear fish for sale. To the east of those is the marsh area, which attracts a great many migrant birds. Uh, in the southeastern corner, beyond the marsh, is our market garden area, growing vegetables and flowers. Section 2 You will hear an introductory talk about a new agricultural park. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome to Greenvale Agricultural Park. As you know, we've only been open a week, so you're amongst our first visitors. We have lots of fascinating indoor and outdoor exhibits on our huge complex, spreading hundreds of hectares. Our remit is to give educational opportunities to the wider public as well as to offer research sites for a wide variety of agriculturists and other scientists. Let's start by seeing what there is to do. As you can see uh, here on our giant wall plan, we are now situated in the reception block here. As you walk out of the main door into the park, there's a path you can follow. If you follow this route, you'll immediately come into the rare breed section where we keep a wide variety of animals, which I shall be telling you a little more about later. Next to this, uh, moving east, is the large grazing area for the rare breeds. Uh, then further east, in the largest section of our park, is the forest area. Um, south of the grazing area, and in fact just next to the reception block, is our experimental crop area. In the middle of the park, uh, this circular area, is our lake. Uh, these two small rectangular shapes here are the fish farms where we rear fish for sale. To the east of those is the marsh area, which attracts a great many migrant birds. Uh, in the southeastern corner, beyond the marsh, is our market garden area, growing vegetables and flowers. Before you hear the rest of the interview, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. Now, we've also put together a map 
which we've sent out to all the residents in the area. And on the map, we've marked the proposed changes. Firstly, we'll plant mature pine trees to provide shelter and shade just to the right of the supermarket in Days Road. In order to address the traffic problems, the pavements on the corner of Carberry and Thomas Street will be widened. This will help to reduce the speed of vehicles entering Thomas Street. We think it's very important to separate the local residential streets from the main road, so the roadway at the entrance to Thomas Street from Days Road will be painted red. This should mark it more clearly and act as a signal for traffic to slow down. One way of making sure that the pedestrians are safe is to increase signage at the intersections. A Keep Clear sign will be erected at the junction of Evelyn Street and Hill Street to enable traffic to exit at all times. Something we're planning to do to help control the flow of traffic in the area is to install traffic lights halfway down Hill Street where it crosses Day's Road. Now, we haven't only thought about the cars and traffic, of course. There's also something for the children. We're going to get school children in the area to research a local story, the life of a local sports hero, perhaps. And an artist will incorporate that story into paintings on the wall of a building on the other side of Hill Street from the supermarket. And finally, we've agreed to build a new children's playground, which will be at the other end of Hill Street, close to the intersection with Carberry Street. Wonderful. Now, what's the next stage? Well, the final plan... Will... Before you hear the rest of the interview, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. Now, we've also put together a map which we've sent out to all the residents in the area. And on the map we've marked the proposed changes. Firstly, we'll plant mature pine trees to provide shelter and shade just to the right of the supermarket in Days Road. In order to address the traffic problems, the pavements on the corner of Carberry and Thomas Street will be widened. This will help to reduce the speed of vehicles entering Thomas Street. We think it's very important to separate the local residential streets from the main road, so the roadway at the entrance to Thomas Street from Days Road will be painted red. This should mark it more clearly and act as a signal for traffic to slow down. One way of making sure that the pedestrians are safe is to increase signage at the intersections. A Keep Clear sign will be erected at the junction of Evelyn Street and Hill Street to enable traffic to exit at all times. Something we're planning to do to help control the flow of traffic in the area is to install traffic lights halfway down Hill Street where it crosses Days Road. Now, we haven't only thought about the cars and traffic, of course. There's also something for the children. We're going to get school children in the area to research a local story, the life of a local sports hero, perhaps and an artist will incorporate that story into paintings on the wall of a building on the other side of Hill Street from the supermarket. And, finally, we've agreed to build a new children's playground, which will be at the other end of Hill Street, close to the intersection with Carberry Street. Wonderful. Now, what's the next stage? Well, the final plan... What are antibodies? Well, antibodies are made by white blood cells called B lymphocytes, and this is done in response to the presence of antigens or other bacterial toxins which have been released by the microorganisms, what we commonly refer to as germs, that have invaded the body. These Y-shaped antibodies, or you can think of them as antitoxins, may stop the toxins or repair the damage they have done by what is known as the antigen antibody reaction which takes place within the plasma of the blood a correct antibody for that disease clings to a particular antigen 
in order to render it harmless. Large numbers of these pairs clump together to form a bigger unit. This is called agglutination and is able to be seen by the naked eye, which is very helpful for doctors and other specialists to determine which illnesses a patient is immune to. Inoculation or active vaccination can protect people from serious diseases. The vaccine may make a person feel unwell for a few days when the immune system starts to produce antibodies to match the introduced antigen. This is called a primary reaction. If that particular antigen should ever enter the body again later, a secondary reaction takes place. The body is then able to produce large numbers of corresponding antibodies within a short time, so the invading antigens are quickly wiped out without the person suffering any harm from the disease. What are antibodies? Well, antibodies are made by white blood cells called B lymphocytes, and this is done in response to the presence of antigens or other bacterial toxins which have been released by the microorganisms, what we commonly refer to as germs, that have invaded the body. These Y-shaped antibodies, or you can think of them as antitoxins, may stop the toxins or repair the damage they have done by what is known as the antigen-antibody reaction, which takes place within the plasma of the blood. A correct antibody for that disease clings to a particular antigen in order to render it harmless. Large numbers of these pairs clump together to form a bigger unit. This is called agglutination and is able to be seen by the naked eye which is very helpful for doctors and other specialists to determine which illnesses a patient is immune to. Inoculation or active vaccination can protect people from serious diseases. The vaccine may make a person feel unwell for a few days when the immune system starts to produce antibodies to match the introduced antigen. This is called a primary reaction. If that particular antigen should ever enter the body again later, a secondary reaction takes place. The body is then able to produce large numbers of corresponding antibodies within a short time, so the invading antigens are quickly wiped out without the person suffering any harm from the disease. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. As we enter the museum from the south by going through the main entrance, as I said before, you'll find the cloakroom immediately on your left and on your right is the museum shop. They have an outstanding range of postcards and souvenirs in there and it's well worth a visit, but perhaps best left till you're on your way out. Then you'll know exactly what you want. The big room to the right of the entrance behind the shop is the reference library. Straight ahead of you, yes, the huge circular room is the main reading room. If you decide to go in there, please keep noise to a minimum out of respect for the writers and scholars who use it for their research. The reading room is surrounded by what is known as the Great Court. Indeed, it used to be an open courtyard, but you will see that it is now completely covered by a magnificent glass and steel structure. If you walk around the Great Court in a clockwise direction, on the west side you'll see the entrance to the Long Hall of Ancient Egypt, which has an amazing collection of Egyptian antiquities. The gallery behind the reading room, directly opposite the entrance, is devoted to China and Southeast Asia. Here you'll see Chinese civilization explored chronologically from the Neolithic period through to the 21st century. 
The restrooms for both men and women are located in the northeast corner of this floor, but don't worry, there are others available on the floors above. Another huge gallery extends along the eastern side of the courtyard, and this is given over to Greece and Rome. The sculptures in this section are absolutely spellbinding. Take your time looking at all the exhibits, and when you're ready to view what's on the next floor, take the magnificent marble staircase by the entrance. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. As we enter the museum from the south by going through the main entrance, as I said before, you'll find the cloakroom immediately on your left and on your right is the museum shop. They have an outstanding range of postcards and souvenirs in there and it's well worth a visit, but perhaps best left till you're on your way out. Then you'll know exactly what you want. The big room to the right of the entrance behind the shop is the reference library. Straight ahead of you, yes, the huge circular room is the main reading room. If you decide to go in there, please keep noise to a minimum out of respect for the writers and scholars who use it for their research. The reading room is surrounded by what is known as the Great Court. Indeed, it used to be an open courtyard, but you will see that it is now completely covered by a magnificent glass and steel structure. If you walk around the Great Court in a clockwise direction, on the west side, you'll see the entrance to the Long Hall of Ancient Egypt, which has an amazing collection of Egyptian antiquities. The gallery behind the reading room, directly opposite the entrance, is devoted to China and Southeast Asia. Here you'll see Chinese civilization explored chronologically from the Neolithic period through to the 21st century. The restrooms for both men and women are located in the northeast corner of this floor, but don't worry, there are others available on the floors above. Another huge gallery extends along the eastern side of the courtyard, and this is given over to Greece and Rome. The sculptures in this section are absolutely spellbinding. Take your time looking at all the exhibits, and when you're ready to view what's on the next floor, take the magnificent marble staircase by the entrance.